Ambassador, in the first two videos we saw you spoke about the evolution of India's foreign policy and uh, then uh, you sort of compared and reflected on foreign policy under Vajpayee and Modi, uh, whether it uh, indicates a continuity or change. We move to the third video now and uh, this is uh, in the context this relates to India and US. Uh, we have had a very indifferent and if I can say hostile relations between the two countries. And from that time of Cold War era, uh, how do you explain the elevation of that and transformation of that relationship to the present state of co comprehensive global strategic partnership? Well, uh, I'm glad you have uh, raised this issue because I think it's not only a watershed in India's foreign policy, it's probably a story that can stand out in the history of relations between countries of how dramatic U-turns can take, take place under leadership. Okay. Now, I will add a little personal element to it because I've spent a considerable amount of my career dealing with the United States. And uh, interestingly, my first posting was during the Cold War period. And uh, just when the Cold War was ending, but the freeze was going on in Indo-US relations. Then there were signs of change. And so there was a transition. By then I had come to Delhi and I was foreign secretary when Clinton was the president. Okay. I actually went to Washington to negotiate the details of his visit and he yes. came. Okay. Very excellent visit and rest is history. And then I went to Washington as ambassador yes. after and mm -hmm. saw the actual transition blossoming into a strategic partnership under President George W. Bush. So uh, I have a personal perspective Undoubtedly, from, you are in the best position to from, from comment on that. Inside seat of seeing all this. So, let me take you through the process of transition. Now, way back during the Cold War years, the, as you said, the relations were indifferent, often hostile. And let me uh, give a perceptive quotation from Winston Churchill yes. to explain US behavior. What Churchill said was that the Americans always do the right thing only after they have tried everything else. So my point here is yes. the Americans made a 50-year misjudgment of India and we went through that and fortunately they are now doing the right thing. The right okay. So this is how it is. What was it like in the Cold War period? If you go back the American public didn't know much about India. You know, India was still a land, uh, land of Maharajas and snake charmers and so on. And uh, there were the missionaries who reported how poor India was. So India was a, a, a desperately poor country, which was often referred to as a basket case, as a black hole and so on. So Steve Cohen, one of the best academic authorities on India in the United States said that in those years India was of a charitable interest to the United States not of any strategic interest. So that is what was what it like. Now the change came by the turn of the century and I'm now talking of end of the Cold War and by the turn of the century I'm going back to my uh, period of the transition. Yes. Okay. What the transition showed was that the American view of India had changed dramatically. Not that we had done anything to, to make the Americans be more friendly, but Americans began to realize that the picture they had of India was unrealistic. So they were not looking at India as a black hole or a basket case. Actually, American business was looking at India as a potential multi-billion dollar market. Because by then, 
Yes. The economic reforms were kicking through and India was developing. Uh, and as, as a uh, as a apt description of the change, yes. I'll quote an, a, a, a very uh, well-known American journalist called Tom Friedman, who came to India yes. and was surprised to see what India was like and wrote a series of articles in the New York Times. I remember one of the remarks he made was that a generation ago, American parents will tell their children, fish the food on your plate. Think of the millions of starving Indian children. Okay? He said, today, Friedman writes, American parents are telling the children, finish the food on your plate, otherwise the Indians will take your jobs. So this was That a, was the great transition. The transition in the, yes. the image of India. And the image was also catching on with the State Department, though they were a little behind the developments. The State Department and the Pentagon during the Cold War period had no interest in India because they thought India was too unwieldy, it was a dysfunctional democracy and India was unreliable. So they placed their bets on Pakistan, not India. Now, circumstances were forcing State Department and Pentagon to take a new look at India. It didn't come from them, it came from outside. First came the Congress. The Congress was getting interest in India because of the visibility of the Indian diaspora. These people who had gone there looking for jobs were now citizens of the United States. And they were prosperous and they were taking an interest in politics. During the period of transition, they were visible because they were fundraisers for congressmen and senators. And so the Congress took a lot of interest in the Indian American community and thereby India. Okay. So <clears throat> the diaspora has now become a part of American politics. And it contributed to the change of perception, change in perception. Yes. Because they were the top of every profession, yes. whether it's engineering or academics, financial uh, sector, financial sector, and so on. And so the uh, that is reflected today that not only do you have a vice president of the United States of Indian origin, the first, you have a group of congressmen who are called the Samosa Caucus. Because there are a handful of congressmen and congresswomen yes. who are speaking for India, but not, they are not the only ones. The whole Congress is interested in India, but you have actually people of Indian origin being there in the Congress. So this was a major change. Now, I, I think there are two uh, types of changes. One is the situational. What I described is situation. The situation of global politics changed and global politics was heading towards a different direction and the world was becoming a little bit in turmoil because countries like China were coming up and American leaders were not very certain how to face the changes coming up and therefore India's turn came up, name came up. Henry Kissinger. Uh, he writes about uh, in 1994 or something. He uh, writes about uh, how America, in his view, was the strongest country on earth ever in human history. Okay. This is 1994. Yes. Just fast forward to 2000, 2001, that had changed. George W. Bush as president was looking at the world in turmoil and he was thinking of whether America shouldn't court India to uh, friendship as a kind of counterweight to China, something that we may discuss a little later. But the world was also changing, so the situational changes had already taken place. But situational changes are not enough in foreign policy. You need leadership related changes. Because an opportunity may be there, but yes. the leadership may be lacking. And fortunately, we had great leaders on both sides. U.S. Vajpayee 
on the Indian side. And Bajpayee's contribution was, he described America and India as natural allies. This would have been heresy in the Cold War period. But Bajpayee had the courage to say it. And on the other side was George W. Bush, who as I mentioned, had come to the conclusion that the US needed India as a counterweight to China and he was prepared to pay the price. He was prepared to listen to Indian demands and he was willing to pay the price. So the leadership on both sides also were convinced that a new relationship was due. And the process of transition had begun in the period of George W. Bush. Okay. So I think both these contributed to the changes. Okay. And then we can proceed with the next part and of the coming to the comprehensive global. Yes. Now that came about in the time of Prime Minister Modi. So we will not describe it now, but keep it. Yes. But what was happening was while the transition was taking place in Washington and in India, there was a team which was supporting Vajpayee and a team supporting um, George W. Bush. Okay. And I think you may like to know. Yes, I would like to. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to name them uh, with their uh, contribution? Yeah, okay. Because you have seen uh, Indo-US as uh, the deputy chief of mission there. Uh, you were foreign secretary followed by India's ambassador in Washington. So these were uh, sort of apex position, uh, quite key and pivotal uh, authority there. So would you like to comment on this aspect? Yes, I'll, I'll describe uh, a bit in detail about the transition because uh, it's just not the leaders. The leaders uh, got on the same page quite quickly, but they had to carry their institutions and their bureaucracy with them. And I want to share something with you. I was convinced after yes. being part of the system that our bureaucracy was unbeatable, that with, with yes. this enormous powers. But when I confronted American bureaucracy, I had a great sense of respect for them. Indian bureaucracy had found a match there. Okay. And so the transition was longer. Yeah. It wasn't just two leaders agreeing and signing an agreement. The transition, transition took place actually for six long years of very tough negotiations by teams from both sides. Okay. while the leaders were benignly looking on, waiting for yes. the breakthrough to take place. So that took place, not in Mr. Vajpayee's time, but after him, yes. with, when Dr. Manmohan Singh was Prime Minister. But the process was canning on. It was continuous. It was Are continuous. there uh, some names that come to your mind? Yes. yes. Now, let me see. I mean, let me tell you about the names on the Indian side, yes. who bear large responsibility for the success of this outreach to the United States. Now, uh, Mr. Bajpai himself, as I mentioned, was a leader who was not very vocal, but it was understood what he was asking for and everybody worked for it. He communicated it in his, in his own way. His own, own way. Yes. And at the head of his list of advisors, was the External Affairs Minister, Mr. Jaswan Singh. He was a very uh, erudite man, very elegant man, very eloquent man. To me, he seemed as if he had been, uh, he had been training for that job from the very beginning. I can't think of any more professional foreign minister in our history than Mr. Jaswan Singh. And you said both. Elegant and eloquent, That's so that, right. yes, right. yes. Now, uh, as I had mentioned, Vajpayee had the brilliant uh, the, the, the initiative to appoint Jaswan Singh as the main spokesman for India and carry on that 19-month long dialogue with Strobe Talbot. And um, as I mentioned, in his inimitable style, he got across to Strobe Talbot. Strobe was not familiar with India. He was actually a Russia expert. And he was a journalist who had not 
uh, understood India. I remember Strobe asking me for a book. He said to prepare for my talks, give me a book which I can read to understand India. So I gave him a copy of Nehru's Discovery of India. Okay. I said it will enable to understand India because Nehru was also doing it as an exercise to understand India even though he was in India. Yes. That's why it's called Discovery of India. So next time Talbot met me, he said, Lalit, thank you. That book is fantastic. I have scribbled, I have underlined places, I have scribbled my comments. It is great. So I take it that they were not just discussing yes. foreign policy. They were discussing two nations, their past, their future and so on, which is why it took 19 months to come to terms. So Jaswant Singh was the top yes. negotiator. But okay. he was looking at the big picture. The other stalwart in the team was Mr. Uh, Brijesh Mishra. The NSA. NSA. He had a very powerful position. He was not only really principal secretary to a prime minister, he was also the national security advisor. But that was not enough. His strength lay in the fact that he was the closest confidant of Prime Minister Vajpayee. Yes. Mr. Vajpayee trusted him. And with that confidence, he took on the negotiations. And I've seen it through. Very tough negotiations because the bureaucracy, yes. as in every exercise, wants to put up all the negatives before yes. conceding. And it was tough going through it. But Brijesh Mishra was a career diplomat. He was also a brilliant negotiator. Yes. And he cut through the bureaucratic layers okay. with great ease because Having been a bureaucrat, bureaucrat himself, he understood what the bureaucrat had been were. one of them. Yes. Yeah. On the other side, his counterpart, Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor, was playing the same role. They have a presidential system. Yes. That means even the bureaucracy is nominated by the president. Yes. But the bureaucracy has an institutional memory. And they put in objections, Pentagon and the State Department brought out objection after objection and it was Condi Rice's job to cut through the bureaucracy and Brijesh Mishra and Condi had a great understanding. So this is how it worked. But there was also a third group. The third group consisted of the professionals in the okay. MEA. I had a batch of very uh, bright young officers who were helping. Yes. Where, I, uh, I led the group when I was foreign secretary and I had the team yes. when I was uh, ambassador in Washington. We were the Sherpas, we carried the baggage and we made the logistical arrangements. So the process was tough but we finally achieved the goal after about six years of negotiations. Okay. At the end of my tenure, which was also the end of George W. Bush's tenure right. as his the first president. term, first term, and the end of Mr. Vajpayee's tenure right. as Prime Minister, we hadn't achieved strategic partnership. We had an agreement on the next steps to achieve the strategic partnership. The stage had been set. The stage had been set. set. Huh. So I like to say that we were like the, you know, the, the workers who dug the foundations and then the, the thing could come in yeah. place, yes. So that is how Dr. Manmohan Singh, whose, whose role, own role should not be under, uh, underestimated because he staked the future of his government and yeah. took a trust vote in parliament to get the nuclear deal through. There was so much of opposition in India. But you look at it, uh, 2005, Dr. Manmohan Singh comes in. 2005 is when the nuclear deal is, is, uh, uh, is completed and the uh, strategic partnership is accepted, which Bachwai had proposed. And so, the uh, rest of it, as they say, is history. The, right. the sanctions were withdrawn. We have given access to the, the uh, uh, yes. high tech of the United yes. States, including military tech. And relations have been getting better and better and better. We have been on the path. We've been on the path yes. and it took Mr. Modi, uh, the third Prime Minister, to stake the uh, same uh, view on the United States. And in 2020, he announced 
the new designation which is comprehensive and global strategic partnership which i think is yes. the highest level of strategic partnership that we have with any country uh, thank you ambassador we come to the end of uh, the third video and in the next video we would talk about uh, this uh, counterbalance uh, whether it is really so thank you thank you